please welcome CTO Oculus, John Carmack. All right, so I've uh, been told that we're not doing live Q&A here, but after this, I'm just walking out onto the floor, so anybody that has any questions, I'll be there the rest of the day. You can come up and we'll get some answers. So uh, I'm almost an explicit counterpoint to a lot of the long-term visionary talk that happens, and I, <laughs> it's not that it isn't important. A lot of people find a lot of great motivation from it, and some things do need long-term commitment. I am really happy that Facebook does have this long-term commitment to research and development of new technologies. But in some ways, a long-term vision can be a rug that you sweep your current shortcomings under. I, you know, if you're not concentrating on what's right in front of you all of the time, it can be an issue. So I try to be constantly critical. And Michael Abrash and I just serve fundamentally different purposes inside this company. <laughs> and, you know, at our last uh, big company offsite, where there was lots of talk about strategy and vision and what we were doing, I kind of grumpily went back to my hotel room and I pulled out my Go and I started making a list of 100 things wrong with our software right now. <laughs> and I eventually, you know, came to my senses and realized that wasn't going to be a great thing to just dump in one of our internal groups. And I wound up, I uh, kind of distilling it down to something that I counted over 20 different ways that we demonstrate focus in VR just in our first party apps. When you move the cursor onto something in an application, does it highlight, does it change the border around it, does it underline, does it bold, does it uh, change the background color, does it grow wings around it, all of these other possible things. And that's crazy, you know, we don't need, we've explored practically every nook and cranny of the solution space all at one time. And uh, you know, why does store look like this and gallery look like that? And some of it's from messy evolution. You know, some of these things are four years old in evolution, the way they've come up from the original Gear VR Innovator Edition. But some of it's also that we've committed the sin of kind of shipping the org chart, different teams without a whole lot of collaboration between them. And these are things that, that I fret about quite a bit. You know, and they're mundane things, and you know, maybe they're not the most important thing, but uh, I think that fixing individual little things like this is how you wind up, I think local hill climbing to just have better quality, better features is the best path to success. Now, over the weekend, I went back and watched my OC4 keynote again. And honestly, there's several things that I talked about that I don't give us a very good grade at following up on. But I am happy to say that what I thought was the most important topic of discussion, which was shipping Oculus Go, turned out really well. And I like Go a lot, but more importantly, our users really like it also. And one of the things that's kind of remarkable here is Gear VR has shipped uh, an incredible number of units. It's kind of by far the most successful VR headset, but it hasn't really been a very sticky product where people get it, they try some applications, they give it a good review and they like it, but generally they drift away after not too terribly long. Maybe they bring it back out for family get-togethers to show off, to show a few people VR that haven't seen it before. But on the other hand, Rift is, is very retentive. People come back to Rift week after week, and they spend a lot of time in it. Now, I was probably the, the most optimistic inside Oculus about how well Go would do, but it turned out that it exceeded even my expectations. Uh, it's, the remarkable point is Go is retaining as well as Rift. And that's pretty shocking. Nobody predicted that. And it's not clear that we know exactly why. There's a lot of theories that we have about why the experience is so different. Um, but the content you're interacting with is pretty close to the same things that you had on the Gear VR experience. There are some things that are definitely better with Go where it's a little bit more comfortable, the screen's a little bit higher resolution, the optics are a bit better. Maybe things at the margin just add up. Maybe the 72 frames per second display lets more people that just couldn't stand the flicker of 60 work on some of the applications, but there aren't that many applications that actually run it at 72. You know, we used to theorize that maybe overheats on the older phones were a really terrible thing that drove people away, but the newer Samsung phones are quite a bit more powerful than Go, and they don't really overheat, so that's probably not a killer issue. Also, we realize later that when somebody does overheat the phone, it's probably because they're having a great time and they've been playing for a while, so that's not driving them away. 
you know, we do think that there are aspects of kind of poisonous user experiences that, that happen that kind of kick people out of the platform where most people have probably had the experience with the Gear VR. You haven't used it in a while. You say, oh, I'm going to try something in Gear VR. And you plug it into the, get out the do phone, dock it there. And then it says, oh, you need to undock for some update. <laughs> you take it out, and that kind of kills the experience there, where if you're doing it every day, it's just part of the, the process there. But if that was, you had just tipped over into wanting to get back into VR, and then you got kind of slapped with that experience, that's a bad thing. There are still cases where the, the user experience degrades a bit when you're downloading at the same time, and it starts stuttering or having other problems. So maybe these are the poisonous things that, that drive people off. There's also theories that just I, people worry about dra draining their phone battery, that their phone that they, constant, that they rely on for their daily life, that they don't want to go ahead and pull half the charge out of it for a VR session. So that might be something. But you know, whatever the cause is, the Go users are behaving very differently than the Gear VR users. I, demographically, no huge surprises. Uh, we are strongest with uh, somewhat older people. It's still very male-dominated. Uh, the one shock was how well we've done in Japan, where we are not catering to the Japanese market. We don't have great internationalization for, uh, for Japanese in the different areas, but something about Go has really struck a nerve in the, the Japanese market and consciousness. And so I'm not, we're still not quite sure what we can actually do about that, given all of our uh, kind of structural inertia on things, but that was an interesting data point. Uh, there's some bright spots that we hear from uh, like teenagers, that uh, people that have, in some ways, more limited freedom, I could say, that virtual reality has more to offer them. When you don't have a lot, that you, a lot of control necessarily in your life, the ability to go do things in your own virtual world is pretty exciting. And there's, uh, there's some, some interesting possibilities as we look at lower and lower potential price points in other areas of the world. I would say that probably one of the reasons for the Japanese success is the density of population. When you are in a small area, being able to open up a large virtual world is pretty freeing. So the things that we've done really well with Go, the convenience, I think, of standalone is the number one most important thing. Uh, the $199 price point is really important psychologically, although it's noteworthy that the, the more expensive 64 gig version actually is more popular and more units of that uh, get sold. Uh, the audio was a huge, huge win. And, I mean, everybody that used a Gear VR, not one person in probably 50 would plug in headphones for an experience there. So all you got was the little mono speaker coming out of the phone. While the audio in Go, it doesn't satisfy an audio file, and people can complain about it, but it does give excellent positional 3D stereoscopic spatialized sound, and it's just there by default. Uh, it's more convenient than the flip-down Rift headphones. And I, I definitely gave a big thank you to the, uh, the team that worked that out, because I think it's one of Go's really great innovations. The better thermals uh, is something that we don't really overheat. The only time I've ever overheated a Go is uh, when I had a rogue thread running that didn't shut down, and I put it face down on my desk so that the whole front surface plate really couldn't dissipate any heat. And I do think it was kind of a, a neat piece of industrial design, the, the whole metal front plate that serves the the important thermal dissipation role, but it also, I think, gives it a nice quality feel to the product. Uh, one of the things that was a late addition that uh, was well after uh, Oculus Connect last year is the addition of the 72 frames per second video, where we found out fairly early on that we had some margin for raising the, uh, for raising the refresh rate. And the reasons you want to do this are because 60 frames per second is flickery for some people. It varies from person to person. But for some people, it's almost unwatchable, and some people hardly notice it. But the other point for 72 precisely is that it's three times the, the standard 24 frames per second movie rate. So a lot of things on Netflix or in the movie theater have a smoother release rate when you can kind of exactly hit that number. Now, that was a bit of a struggle internally because the, uh, the displays are specified. They've got specs for different, uh, different ranges of conditions. And the hardware engineers are much more conservative than software engineers, where uh, as a software engineer, I'm likely to just say, well, let's just see what happens. And that just kind of gives sense shivers down the spines of a lot of the hardware people. So we did a lot of testing with it. And there are some edge cases where 
The, the issue with LCD displays is that they're temperature sensitive. So the cooler it is, the slower the LCDs uh, kind of change state from one state to another. And if you, left, uh, if you left to go out in a car in Wisconsin in the winter and then brought it into your house uh, and turned it on, you are very likely going to see multiple ghosts on the screen as it's incapable of changing completely from one, uh, one state to another. But in most normal cases, inside houses, it works fine. And in fact, we've got a little bit more margin. It would be possible for us to raise it a little more, but I don't think there's any sweet spots uh, kind of above that where we can't go all the way to 120 hertz and the difference between 72 hertz and 80, it would be worse for the video cases. And I think the fraction of people that that makes a critical difference for would be really small and it would be a lot more power drain to be rendering that much faster. So the, uh, another thing that was ready by the end was the foveated rendering extension. And this is another great example of how having everything in-house was a huge win for us, where multi-view rendering, I had been talking about probably as an idea at OC1, and then again at 2, 3, and 4. And it took us over two years to get that through from the time that Here's the plan, here's the extension, to the point where developers could really rely on it. And that was just because of these structural issues where Qualcomm and ARM had to both develop the extensions, work them out, bicker about how to do the different, ca different cases where it's better for one platform or the other. Samsung has to pick that up, get it into the ne their next release. Then it has to go to all the carriers, and they have to decide when they're going to allow that to go to their customers. And it was pretty miserable. I mean, that was a real learning experience for me that it could take that long. In contrast, the foveated rendering extension was something that we did directly with Qualcomm since there's only one chipset uh, in the go. And we worked it out, we got it in there, our OS team integrated it, and it shipped, and everything worked great. And that was a, you know, a solid little performance improvement. It's not huge, but it's 15% or so in many cases. And in a lot of cases, that's the difference that allows you to go ahead and run at 72 frames per second instead of 60. But there are a bunch of things that I'm not super happy with with Go. Like the, the split backstrap on Go was intended to support different hairstyles. There are people that, uh, that the standard over the back uh, strip just didn't work very well for, and so splitting like that would allow a bun or whatever to fit through in between. But what it wound up doing is unloading the top strap. So if the top strap is connected to the, uh, the over the head strap is connected to the top part of the split, it just lifts up and down and it can't take much of the weight from that. And I've seen some people actually pulling the strap all the way down to the bottom one so you can get it behind your head. And I don't think we hit the right thing with that. Um, you can actually take a Gear VR strap and with a little bit of scissor work on it, uh, get it to fit inside a Go and have the conventional one back strap. And also on that note, I, the facial interface, it drip, I, the bottom of it extends kind of below the plastic part, which is somewhat important on the side on the cheeks, but it's not a good thing around your nose, where if it's depending on where it's sitting on your face, it might actually be reflecting some of your breath back at you. And that's another thing, I pulled off the facial interface and take the scissors to it and cut around the nose there as a slight modification. I, Right around that same area, one of the things that I complained immediately when I saw the prototypes of Go was the amount of light leakage around the nose, where it was basically a rift design. And I, I really like the fact that Gear VR has very tight light leakage, or very little light leakage around there. You can immerse yourself pretty fully while with Rift or Go's uh, space around the nose, you can kind of see all the light down there. You can move your hand and see it like that. And for a truly immersive experience, like if you, were, if you had that in something like The Void, that would completely destroy the experience. But I've been pretty surprised to see a lot of our user studies, people coming back, and so many people think that that was the intentional design to let you kind of peek at your hand and peek at different things. And I may be coming around to that being maybe a wash. It hurts on the immersion, but uh, a lot of people do like that little bit of extra being able to see through there. I, one of our things that has clearly failed in a lot of ways is the proximity sensor, where the idea with the standalone is you pick it up, you put it on your head, and you're magically into VR immediately. 
but we had so many problems with the straps on the back, the very soft straps falling down into the face of that where that becomes a, it triggers the proc sensor and we've got all these heuristics about, well, even though the proc sensor's triggered, it hasn't moved in this long, we think it's idle, we'll turn it off so the battery doesn't run down. Uh, but it also means then a lot of times you pick it up and you do have to manually turn on the hit the power switch. And it's in almost a worst case scenario now where you have to worry about it not doing it when you, uh, you set it down and running down your battery a little bit or not immediately coming up when you put it on. So we're probably going to be putting in a setting option for this where a setting that lets you just say ignore the proc sensor, require the power, power button to be pressed, which is one of the things that a lot of people in business and location-based systems really want. They want people to not have to worry about that, and also the recenter dialog, where a lot of installations want to basically have, here, put this headset on and see our, uh, our movie, our 360 immersive media and whatever. And we, if we add those two settings and you can say turn off the proximity sensor and turn off the recenter dialog, then you can write software that does just on mount, restart it, do simple things like that. And that should be a really useful thing. Now, since we shipped Go, uh, we've already had a number of improvements. Uh, we shipped big new apps with venues and TV. One of the things that got announced at the keynote yesterday that it's kind of a geeky uh, detour on this, but I'm super proud of the way the new chromatic aberration correction stuff got worked out that I, we had chromatic aberration correction on the very first Gear VR. It was an option you could set on the flags, and we set it on a number of our early applications, but as we were moving to the later phones, we turned it off of most things because it was a power issue, and it did make things a little bit slower, and we had some tearing issues and all this. So for the most part on Gear VR, where the optics got pretty blurry quickly away from the center, where chromatic aberration starts really showing up, I, I thought it was a fair trade to just leave it off, get the performance and battery life. But we were a little bit taken aback when the early Go reviews and some of the, the press reviews started coming in and people were talking about the chromatic aberration that was visible on it. And sometimes they didn't know the actual terms, but we could tell what they were talking about, about color shifts and rainbows and things like that at the corner, that it was the chromatic aberration correction. And we had a little bit of a mini panic internally about our decisions on were we doing the right thing with this. And I did a pretty extensive write-up about here are all the different trade-offs. For games and most typical things, it's usually worth it. It's maybe a millisecond to turn on the old chromatic aberration correction. A lot of games, that's the very best quality performance trade-off you can make if you have margin. If you don't have that millisecond, of course, you're better to not drop frames and not have chromatic aberration correction. But if you've got some margin, that was usually the first thing I would tell people to add. The problem was, in our core VR shell application, and anything that used time warp layers, which was one of my keys to this high quality experience that we were providing, the text that you could read, the, the crystal clear movies and all this, the problem with that was when you composed multiple layers with the chromatic aberration correction, it couldn't do it properly because there was one alpha channel. It would draw one layer and then it would blend the next one on top of it, but it had to have the color spread out and there was only one alpha to blend. So you would wind up, like you could turn it on on browser and the text would then look better, but you would have an even worse chromatic aberration artifact at the edges where it faded out because it couldn't properly blend them together. Now there's obviously ways to fix this. Qualcomm has a, um, uh, an extension called frame buffer fetch where you could go and go ahead and read the frame buffer and do the blending in your fragment shader. And that worked, but it was hideously slow. They had another extension on top of that non-coherent frame buffer fetch, which made it faster because we knew we weren't overlapping things that we were drawing, but it was still like three milliseconds, which is way too much for this. Um, the way Rift does chromatic aberration correction is it renders, composites everything together ignoring that, then it corrects it to another buffer with a full read. I could do that on the mobile systems, but that turned out to be four milliseconds of time, you know, a quarter of your frame time just to do that like this. Because the mobile are especially hurt by these high bandwidth memory operations, like reading the whole 32-bit uncompressed and writing it back out. You know, there were a few more uh, last-ditch things we could have done. There's another thing the hardware could have done called uh, Blend Funk Extended. But I eventually had uh, an idea that seemed potentially interesting, and that was there's a whole section of silicon on these, uh, these chips that we don't use for much of anything at all. That's the display processing unit that does all the upscaling of videos and compositing things over wallpapers and all the normal things that 2D phones do to keep from having the GPU do it. 
and I thought that, you know, it can do stretching of different things. If we wrote out a separate red, green, and blue image, it could stretch, them, stretch the red a little, stretch the blue a little, and leave the green the same, put them all together, and it would work great. But unfortunately, writing out all three of those different ones from the GPU with so much memory overhead, that was also three or four milliseconds completely unusable. Uh, but what I thought is, if there was some way that we could just write out our normal thing, pretending like we were not doing CAC at all, and then if the DPU could be configured somehow, waving hands madly, to take one channel from here and one channel from there and one channel from this as three separate windows, point three windows at this and mux it up somehow, that, that that could then magically fix everything. Now, of course, it doesn't do this in the spec. The spec for the hardware uh, and composer from Android doesn't require anything like that. But uh, you know, I got with the Qualcomm people that we work very closely with, and I laid out the idea and said, this would be great if we could make this work. Could you maybe you know, give me all of the low-level hardware register specs on this, and let me just see if I could come up with anything that could work. And they didn't wind up giving me all the, the register specs of it, but they did wind up basically going down the hall to the guys that built the, the DPU and said, is there any way to get this working? And it turned out there was. Completely undocumented hardware that's not used for anything else, but they're possible to set the muxes this different way, and then all of a sudden we've got the ability to do this. So we now have the ability to have the GPU pretend chromatic aberration doesn't exist and this whole separate part of silicon on the chip magically solves this for us. Now, it still does have some memory bandwidth overhead because it's reading the buffer three times, but it's not writing back out to it. So it doesn't cost anything on performance, really, but it does cost a little bit on battery. And the initial plan was that we were going to A-B test this. It's a couple percent. I am, but everybody that's been using this for a while has just been really clear, this is absolutely worth it. So I think the plan now is that we are just going to roll it out directly to everybody. Um, but that ties in with another feature that we're going to be getting as a setting that's been requested as a low power mode, a mode, you know, a way that we can stretch the battery a little bit more on Go, where the things that we're going to be doing on that are forcing the chromatic aberration off, um, forcing it to a 30 hertz 3D rendering update, um, and also, one thing we're probably going to wind up putting the, uh, putting the display brightness down as well, and also turning it to 60 frames per second. So it's basically turning it more like into a previous generation Gear VR. And this will get you, you know, so maybe it'll be another 15 minutes of video time or something. People would really only do this if you're going to be sitting back watching a video, uh, not interacting too much with it. Another broadly requested feature is USB storage, some way to extend the storage from the go. And it's a little bit of a mixed bag on this, where it turns out we do have some hardware limitations and there's some software licensing issues. So this is not the ideal feature that we might want to have, but we are going to wind up releasing this um, so that you can plug in little micro USBs. It's limited to FAT32 support, so you're limited to four gig files, although you can format it still for very large, uh, very large drives. But it, we do have a hardware problem that we have no workaround for, where at low battery levels, sometimes the plugging in the USB, we can't mount it correctly. And it's just, it's not a perfect feature, but I think it's still worthwhile shipping to users because a lot of people will like this. Although it's also surprising how much power those little USB keys can draw uh, out of the main battery. So it does take a fair bit of your battery away. Uh, night mode is another little feature that somebody suggested it. I prototyped it that day, and we're still just kind of waiting for a setting to make its way through all of our UI to get that out to users. Uh, one of the most exciting features is the, the casting that was talked about on the, on the keynote. And everybody knows the problem of trying to give demos from a Gear VR previously or a Go where you're kind of guessing what the person is looking at, trying to tell them. It's like, no, that thing down on the bottom, look over there, press this button. And it's difficult to run somebody through a demo. And then, of course, it's the whole isolating aspect of it. And when I, I, the mirroring to your phone really does change that. It's remarkable. I had the experience recently just showing my, my kids Thumper for the first time and watching on my phone while they were going through it and giving them a little bit of coaching tips there really did change the experience. So I think this is going to be a really big win for us. 
You know, there's some other things that I'm thinking about as possible futures, like I am possibly the ability to make your phone act as a controller for those times when you forgot the gear, the gear, uh, the Go controller somewhere else, which I've done and had to drive back to another house to go get it to be able to make a demo at some point. Being able to just use your phone as a surrogate controller, or possibly even as a surrogate joypad, which would then unlock a lot of the joypad games, uh, is interesting. One of the features that I I think I've come around on is uh, we have this notion of bed mode, which uh, started in like Netflix having the void theater and our void theater that you could move the, th uh, the screen around. And we generalized that a little bit inside Shell. So we gave you the stable environment, but you could put any panel looking any way, anywhere you want. And this does turn out to be really one of the superpowers of VR. I mean, it seems very kind of mundane, but just being able to put screens at orientations that you can't do with physical objects in the real world in most cases is really powerful. But then everybody says, well, I want this for, you know, for all of my applications. And I have fought against this for years in that I, I remember in my early days of VR experimentation, if you have the world 20 degrees off in a vertical, it's extraordinarily discomforting. And you move through that and the world is all tilted and I just figured that was one of the worst things we could do for comfort. But it does turn out we have a lot of apps that don't involve moving through the world or at least looking around and navigating. And an argument could be made that all of those video or media applications that don't implement a void theater mode explicitly on their own might be better off being able to just reset the vertical directly. I, and I took a, like I did an experiment with a, a random recentering, and I, I played a game that doesn't require looking around. I played Smash Hit for a while, just plowing through while I was on the floor looking up at the ceiling. And that worked fine. I, it was OK. But when I experimented with some other apps that had, I, that had a real sense of a world with a vertical and you're looking around a little bit, I did feel a little bit odd after I, when I came out of VR and the reference was changed. So we have not run this all through complete user testing. But people have been asking for this for years. And I think my position is softening on it as maybe a net value. And recentering brings up one of the points where we did come around to basically doing what Daydream does, does with, uh, with recentering. I think they made the right call in retrospect, where the recenter operation by default recenters not just your controller, but also your view, unless the application explicitly opts out. Um, we had long debates about this, but I think that is the right call in the end. And there's a couple other little things that we've cribbed from Daydream. I added the little thumbprint on the controller that they do. I try to, try to every time I, I, I kind of take a, a hint from them, I try to do it a little bit better. I've got a really nice cursor trails with uh, Bezier Q, uh, quadratic Bezier curves on it that I'm waiting for, again, another setting to turn on. This is a theme for this, where I've got all these things where they're gated on UI in many cases right now. We're trying to make this a priority to make it easier to get some of these little things in. But I think that the, one of the really gratifying things to me is that the problems that people have with Go right now, they tend to be real world problems rather than kind of VR geek problems. It's like the battery doesn't last long enough or it doesn't charge fast enough. Uh, not, you know, how do I do an expressive emote from, uh, from my avatar inside uh, a VR application. You know, these are the same types of things that people complain about about every application or every kind of piece of consumer electronics. So I am. And that does, we, ha we did not have a really clear strategy at Go Launch for exactly what Go was supposed to be, who it was supposed to be for. And we have crystallized that a lot more now, where Go is our device that is 80% media, 20% gaming. Quest, on the other hand, is exactly the opposite. 80% gaming, 20% media. And there's, re there's good reasons why things are slightly different between these. For the media case, like with the, the bed mode and look, putting things on the ceiling, it turns out that screens are really, you know, this is what we do with almost everything during our days. The, I, I've said there's over a trillion dollars that's been put into media that we watch on screens, the things we watch on movie theaters, TV screens, phones, uh, computers, tablets, all of these different devices. So it's crazy to think that those aren't also going to be important inside VR. And making, uh, making ch changes and strategic decisions around implementations around that is, I think, a viable direction. And as almost sort of a response to some of the visionary stuff, I did make one vision pitch internally where I'd say that 
all that we really need here is screens and people. If all that VR did, and it can do so much more, but if all that it did was make amazing screens and allowed you to be co-present with other people while doing that, that would be an enormous value for the world. We could be providing value with that while we're slowly growing these brand new immersive class of applications that don't have precedence before. You know, there's so many things that you can do with that. Obviously, everybody likes the giant screens in there. They like being able to put them bed mode up on, you know, on the ceiling. In theory, we can do things like this can be more ergonomic. Like whenever I see people hunched over laptops or tablets working, you know, that's not the best way to be working. You want to have a nice upright posture looking at things. We can make the screens at a distance where your eyes converge at them naturally rather than in a forced focus direction. Now, obviously, we don't have the resolution that I that we would like for this today. It can't replace a 4K monitor or my three 30-inch monitors that we have at the desktop. But we're not as far off as I thought we might be for being able to replace a lot of these other things. Clearly, people are watching a lot of TV and movies uh, in the system right now. Uh, I'll talk about it later. One of the other major projects that I did this last year was really attacking the virtual desktop approach. And that turned out better than I expected. And there's some good learnings from that. But so if we were to take some of these strategic directions and thinkings and were to design a next generation Go, the trade-offs are kind of interesting to think about relative to what we do on Quest and different things. Uh, obviously, the top one is better battery life. Now, you can get that from literally having a bigger battery or a battery of a higher spec. Uh, or we can get it by having more advanced silicon that's more power efficient, writing better code, doing lots of things, cutting the bloat out of it. Uh, but also faster charging. I, it's great to hear that people have a device that they're upset that they've used Go earlier and it's not fully charged up because they want to use it again. That's a good problem to have. You know, comfort, we can still make uh, we can still make very large strides on. I don't think that we as a company have really taken that as a top line priority. It's all been about packing the technology in and then somehow wrapping a comfortable shape around that technology. But if we start getting to a point where we're willing to sacrifice some technology in some cases in the name of comfort, for a lot of people, that's going to be the right trade-off. I still think that there are exciting things with ultra lightweight displays. And I am, you know, it's great to see people physically hacking with Goes. It's a good platform for that because it's mostly self-contained there. You can carve away plastic. And there's uh, some great stuff that people have done uh, making more comfortable, like changing it to halo straps, cutting away a lot of the weight. These are kind of exciting things. And I've been chastising some of our internal teams. It's like, get with the program or some, you know, some guy in a garage is going to outdo us on the important comfort metrics. <laughs> Uh, obviously, more storage in, uh, internally, so you can store more videos, although USB helps, certainly fixing the problem so it works uh, you know, across the board and reliably. But it's very interesting to come to questions about six degree of freedom tracking, 4K displays, uh, you know, really good tracked controllers. These are all pure goods if they don't have costs, but they do have costs. They trade off in power draw, uh, in, you know, in expense for the product, development time on some of these things. So it's not completely clear. Uh, I think that one of the problems that people do have with Go is, of course, controller drift. You know, the recentering that is a completely unnatural action for people to have to do. It's a failure of the product that the controller does not stay pointing the way your hand is pointing. Uh, that may be actually one of the stronger reasons, even if somebody does nothing but sit in Netflix with an application like this, having the controller always there instead of coming back an hour later and it's off screen and you need to remember to recenter to bring it in, in front of you, that's a good argument for having cameras and some kind of tracking. As well as, of course, the thing that if you're used to VR, you know you just kind of sit there and let the head model do its work, but somebody else is there, they're like, oh, I'm in this, uh, this ski lodge, I'm going to lean forward and look at that magazine, and that's incredibly uncomfortable when you don't have six degree of freedom tracking. Um, Resolution-wise, honestly, by this point, I expected us to have 4K displays, but the phone industry made the surprisingly rational choice that 4K displays don't actually matter in that form factor for anything. I expected specsmanship and the kind of warfare there to carry it over well past the point of rationality, but it turned out not to be the case. I, but still, so VR companies are going to have to foot the bill for this next generation of display density increases. And they're, they're in the pipeline. Uh, it'll be interesting to see exactly which products they, they wind up landing in. Uh, 
then another thing with cameras is hand tracking. Do we, do we want the controller at all if all you're doing is selecting movies and a few different things like this? But hand tracking has significant uh, computational costs as well. And you get into some of the ones that become almost Go specific, like uh, the idea of do we want an ambient light sensor so that we can tell that you're using it in a dark room and you don't want the screen blasting you? Because it turns out that's a real world use case. A lot of people, uh, you know, in our user studies, we've had people that say, yes, I use my Go when I, I'm sitting in bed, my wife is asleep, and I want to, you know, browse the web or something while I, without disturbing them. And that's something that I, is an unusual, it's not something we expected as a common use case, but people are actually doing that. Another one like sunburn protection. It is an issue that if you take a go, nice flat face, you set it down on a picnic table, uh, the leaves blow out of the way, the sun shines down, and you've basically burned a hole in your LCD screen. And that's, we have warnings about this, and we've strengthened these warnings, but it is happening to people. This is something that if you use this device as a part of your life, you're carrying it around, you're setting it down in places, even setting it down by a window with the sun streaming straight in can be a problem. There's technical fixes that we can do for this. I, you know, people have proposed putting an LCD layer that could darken on top of this. I am, Maybe it is a matter, though, the front face shouldn't be flat, so you're not ever inclined to set it down like that. There's, there's other possibilities. But um, So Go was originally a side project. Quest was started before Go existed, and we had this notion that, oh, it'll just be like a Gear VR, and it'll be easy. And of course, it wasn't, and it was an enormous amount of work, and we didn't ship it when we initially hoped we would. Uh, but I'm still very happy that we did that, but most of the focus now has switched over to getting Quest out the door. And in many ways, Quest is the VR device that people dreamed about. It's this standalone six degree of freedom tracked with the, uh, with the hand presence on the controllers. And it does all of this like people want, but it's twice the price of Go. Um, you know, it has, there's a lot more stuff there. It's a heavier headset and there's, we haven't had time to feed back in most of the, the learnings that we had from Go because these projects were all kind of going simultaneously. Uh, one thing that did come back in, we learned some from the Go facial interface work that Quest is, uh, is adopting. Kind of earlier ones were less comfortable than the later ones that have come out. But the, the real bet on this is that the Six Degree of Freedom tracked headset and controllers, the kind of rift parity on this is a magical point for people, that this is something that's going to radically change things. Now, when we were originally making this call, this was before Go even existed, and we had no sense that, that the mobile form factor in Go could even reach the levels of retention that, uh, you know, that we did hit. The only thing that we knew worked was Rift. Uh, and the idea was, well, we're going to bring the qualities that we think are important from Rift down to mobile. Uh, there are things that if we were kind of from scratch right now, we would probably do different with this focus where if we knew this was 80% uh, gaming, 20% media, like one of, the one of the important things on Go is that we knew this lying down prone position for Void Theater was important, so a soft back strap was really important. Uh, ideally, we'd love to be able to chuck some weight back there, like the very first Santa Cruz showing that we had a couple years ago, all of the compute was in the back of it, and it was nicely balanced with that, but you had this big lump back there, there was no way you could lean back on things, and there were problems with the cables and all that, but that is an argument that somebody could make where if you're saying this is a gaming-oriented device, we want people bobbing and weaving around for that, loading something onto the back of the headset in the future probably does make some good sense. Uh, but getting six degree of freedom tracking is going to unlock VR for a good segment of people where we still don't have rigorous numbers about what fraction of the population can't tolerate three off tracking that really does need that. But we know they exist. There's people inside Facebook, I, or an Oculus even, that like, oh, I get immediately sick when I use Go after a very little amount of time. Just they move their head in a certain way. It's sitting on their face in a certain way. I, those people should generally be able to, to wear a Quest because it will respond properly unless they're in experiences like 360 videos where you don't have any response from the tracking. Uh, but if it turns out, like the best case, the home run scenario on this is that we carry over all of the goodness of the Rift experiences, all of the convenience of Go, kind of bring it all together, bringing in the people that could never use the mobile experiences before, and that could be really great. But I am... 
On the other hand, we know sixed off alone isn't magic because the Lenovo Solo is, uh, it has competent sixed off tracking. We think ours is better. We think you can test it and find out different ways that, uh, that they perform differently, but it functions. And I, you know, and that has not seemed to be a magic bullet for them to be able to, to reach tons of people. So is it the controllers that are going to be magic? Is it going to be the software specifically that we can bring over from the Rift? You know, we really don't know yet. Now, one point that, uh, that I don't think has been really clearly stated is that Quest is being presented as a more premium product. Obviously, it costs more. It costs twice as much. But that does mean that the curation at the store is going to be more rigorous. So the people that have been having trouble with the gear or Go stores I am, should steer clear of development on Quest. Now, I'm often sort of the first line of customer support sometimes on Twitter, and I have fielded several, uh, several times when disgruntled developers say it's like, you know, the store rejects my, rejected my application or they dropped this, and they're upset for various reasons, and I will usually get keys from them and I will look at their application. And so far, every time I have come back and said, well, I understand, but the store probably did make the right decision where your, uh, your application here is not kind of additive to the entire store ecosystem. And I try to offer some constructive criticism about you know, how you could possibly bring it to a high enough level to kind of get over the bar and get into the store. And it is something that I still, I'm frustrated with, but I understand why it is the way it is that our store ingestion team can't really give that same feedback. I am, I'm in a position where I can do my app reviews, I can do the, uh, my public app critiques, I can give people these kind of one-off feedback, and it's generally taken you know, fairly well. I mean, I'm spending my time to try to help you out and everybody gets it, but I, our store team generally doesn't feel that they've got a position where they can say, no, this app does all of these things wrong, therefore we're rejecting it because we know from other people and other ecosystems that have done things like this that what happens is the developer comes back and says, well, I did A, B, C, and D just like you told me to, put it in the store now, and then they get told, well, it's still not good enough. Uh, and that's, that can be a kind of toxic situation where it winds up with people railing on the internet and not good for anybody. I, I still hope, hold out hope that we could get some kind of a basic checklist where everybody could say, this is not you don't get in if you do these, but you definitely don't get in if you don't do these because there are still a large fraction of the apps that I think just miss some of these checkbox items, these things that, that should be just nobody even gets, you don't even get considered if you don't have 4X MSAA turned on today. And sometimes we still do kind of let things slip like that. Now, the magical play experience of room scale or arena scale or world scale, I mean, all of this freedom here is incredibly amazing. Just last night, I, after it's like eight or nine o'clock in the evening, uh, somebody was showing me something that had been built in Quill that was like a 20 foot by 30 foot section, this giant sketch. And we were down uh, the lower level of the conference and convention center. Nobody was around, just sketched out a giant guardian thing and put, it inside, put me inside it. And I walked over to another room, walked back, got down on my hands and knees and crawled through a crawlway into another room, you know, looked up inside this aquarium. And this is amazing. You know, this is, a, this is the magic of VR. This is kind of what people imagine doing. But the reality is very rarely do you have this 20 by 30 foot open space that you can, that you can take advantage of experiences like this in. And you know, and I chuckle whenever we have our promotional stuff where you have people, you know, athletic people swinging around wildly and ducking and bending uh, with VR where that's not going to be the reality of the way people are using this product most of the time. And, I, you know, making company strategic decisions uh, around your development around that might not be the wisest thing where it's going to be a niche thing. Uh, one, one direction I... One way of thinking about things that I saw somebody start talking about this year was that a lot of VR rides are like amusement park rides. They're like a roller coaster. And the classic VR things, the bending and diving and chucking things, that is in some ways like this experience that uh, people go to and it's exciting, but you don't necessarily want to be doing that every day or even every week. Uh, and that's why while we say 80-20 split gaming media, I'm pretty much telling people, uh, don't be surprised when people still wind up watching a lot of movies and TV shows inside this, and it's more than 20%. Um, 
I had said before how at the very start of Oculus, I had bet someone else that it's going to be more than 50% of the time not in games. And I've, you know, I've been smug about winning that uh, pretty decisively for a while. But a new data point that came out about a year ago that I was pretty shocked about was that even game consoles, like you take a PS4, average users spend about half their time watching movies and things, using that as their, uh, their set top or box replacement or their DVD player, Blu-ray player. So while gaming is the, the kind of boutique, it's the marquee thing, it's the thing that brings people in and they will make a decision one way or the other, but a lot of the mundane stuff does wind up eating up a lot of the time that people wind up spending there. And then I do worry that in many ways it does come down to people tend towards a little bit of laziness and inaction. I mean, this is what gave us the couch potato and all of this, and while VR can be touted as the antidote to the couch potato, it gets up, makes you active. I talked to somebody here yesterday that was uh, very involved in basically fitness VR stuff, and first I was like, well, don't you have a lot of fogging problems? And they said, not really, surprisingly little, and that VR can be really great for this sort of exercise, but I am dubious about it changing a lot of people's habits where I was disappointed in past years that I couldn't even get people to stand up or spin around in a swivel chair to play games with Gear VR. You know, people generally wanted to just sit down, inert one direction, and move their thumbs instead of moving their body. And that's something to, to keep in mind. You know, it's going to be great to have these athletic superstar events uh, where it looks amazing, but if we want to sell millions and millions to people, it's going to be a lot of people that may still just want to sit down and move their thumbs in some way. In terms of raw processing power, there's always a lot of hedges and, uh, and if buts when you're discussing different things, but Quest is in the neighborhood of the power of a previous gen like Xbox 360 or PS3. Now, just in terms of CPU and GPU, what you can expect to do on it. But the important thing to keep in mind is that most games on that generation rendered a 1280 by 720 view at 30 frames per second, and most of them did not have very good anti-aliasing. While in VR, we're hoping that you can render at 1280 by 1280, twice for stereo and 72 frames per second, which is eight and a half times more pixels than you would have on an old 360 game. Plus, you want to be in 4X MSAA and trilinear filtering, which are some percentages additional on top of that. So there, it is not possible to take a game that, that was done at a high quality level, like a AAA title for that generation, and expect it to look like that in VR. It's too many more pixels to wind up rendering. Uh, on the upside, we do have far more texture memory and far more main memory in general than you had on those platforms. So some of the development can be easier, and in many cases, you can trade really rich textures for complex shaders and, uh, and multi-pass rendering in different ways. And essentially, realistically, we are going to wind up competing with the Nintendo Switch as a device where... Uh, I don't think there's going to be that many people that say, I'm not going to buy a PS4, I'm going to buy a Quest instead. I think we're going to have people that, like, I'm a gamer, I've got, you know, my brand of choice for the main console, I've maybe got a PC that I play games on, I'm going to pick up a Quest as a mobile device, uh, very much like the Switch is right now. So I do stand by the statement that I've made that the core magic of any Rift experience can be brought to this, but you can't ignore the level of processing power differences. Well, I'd say it's, I, you know, it's a big high-end PC can use up to 500 watts of power, and something like this is earning five-something, you know, a little bit more. There's almost a factor of 100 difference in the total power. But really, in any game, you're only generally concentrating on a half dozen or so things. There's some psychology behind the, you know, how many things your mind can focus on. And while there are some games and experiences that need thousands of something for its aesthetic, that's not the thing that's going to work uh, well on Quest. But when you've got something, here I am moving in an environment, these other things are moving, my hands are tracked here, I'm performing actions at some rate, all of that can come through. But it may, it may need a different programming style than, uh, than what's, been what's been necessary or possible on the PC. Where outside of AAA productions, PC development is really pretty nice right now. Uh, you've got so much power kind of to burn and at your disposal that you don't have to be 
hardcore hotshot technical programmer to do an amazing game that people love because you can afford to do things in a way that's easy for you, that's convenient for your design. You don't really have that convenience on any mobile platform, really, but especially on a mobile VR platform where we've got so much other things that you need to do beyond just rendering the cell phone screen. There's, I, you know, I've given a couple talks already at the, I, the app reviews and the start session. I'll, I'll go back over some of that work here. But, uh, and then I'm in, the, again, I'm in the hallways to offer advice for the rest of the day. There are a checklist of things that you can start doing. If you take your Rift game, and if you're using Unity or Unreal, there's a decent chance you'll be able to click a little magic checkbox and have it compile for Quest. I am, the odds of it actually running well initially are near zero. There's almost no application that uh, was run on the PC that would come out and run properly on Quest at that point. But there are some applications that, that had a mobile-friendly aesthetic that could be brought over with not too much work that came down to just making sure you're hitting the right buttons, turning the right knobs, doing the right settings. But unfortunately, most applications are going to require more surgery. They will require kind of a rethink of the way you handle things, a rethink of what you're doing in the game, where if you take a game down to its schematic elements, you're looking at this action is producing this feedback and this response. Now, this feedback could be you know, an immense particle system with dynamic lighting and fragment models spraying out. In a mobile game, that might turn into enabling one surface of a muzzle flash. And I, but I have seen games that do this high end, throw lots of particles and other stuff coming out of the front that are worse user experiences than just throwing the one flash of muzzle flash up there in the right position. So there's tons of wisdom in past generations of game devices. You know, if you go back to the uh, earlier generations like the PS1 or uh, newer games like the, the Nintendo DS. These are games where people have done landmark games that people have loved for decades with far, far more limited power than what you've got with a Quest. So, I mean, these were, you're talking tens of megahertz processors in some cases versus, you know, we go well over a gigahertz on the, the processing rates here. So it's certainly possible, but many people that are into gaming in the last five years as developers have never had to exercise these muscles. Now, I always recommend that it's good for you to go ahead and learn about all of this, but the, uh, the other option is to just find the right partners. You know, partner up the, the right game designers with the right technical people, and that's been a path to great success. Uh, it might mean expanding your team or forming different connections, but that's, uh, in many cases, you'll have to do that to get the same, to not have horrible compromises made as you're bringing things over. So some of the things that just go right out the window is forget about any kind of dynamic shadow mapping. It's like, yes, it's possible to make it happen and work on mobile, but that is the last thing you need to be focusing on. If you need something to say, give grounding to characters, blend the little blurry blob underneath them like games have done for so long. Shadow mapping is just one example of these uh, secondary or tertiary rendering passes which, again, it's possible. In almost all of these, there are all these caveats, like, yes, you can do a game that does this, but it's probably not a good idea. You know, learn the rules before you decide to break the rules here. Anything else that causes an additional render, certainly any envi dynamic environment mapping, but also many secondary screen renders inside environments. And these are things that, that are going to, you will pay for them, trying to do them on the mobile systems. Uh, the first thing that I do when I look at an application for performance is uh, I start up Snapdragon Profiler is usually my tool of choice, and it's, it comes with a whole lot of caveats. I, it is not the most reliable piece of software because it has to work across, or it has to attempt to work across every, uh, every different phone and tablet that uses that, so it's not specialized for anything, and it does have a tendency to kind of go up or down on different features across releases. But over the last three or four years, it has had some solid positive improvements, and it pretty much mostly works for me on Go most of the time. Um, so the first thing I do is I start that up, I run the application, get into some place in the game where it's not performing well, and I take a, a live trace, and, and I look at how often, how much the GPU is being used and kind of in what blocks. Um, because the first thing I look for is if you see 
multiple GPU blocks happening inside each frame. It's like, oh, they're rendering something off here. What is it? I can look through the other captures to try to find out what it is. But that's the first thing that you, start, you stop doing is get down so that you're passing one set of geometry through multi-view to generate your two stereo eyes. Uh, that's by far the best path, the path that you want to be on. Uh, the second thing that I start looking at is going over and look at the resources that are, going, uh, that are being used. A lot of times on PC, you have uncompressed 32-bit textures, which are, in many cases, six or seven times slower than the better compressed textures on mobile. And this uh, early, like in the early days of Gear VR, this was al almost every application I was going through saying, compress your textures, compress your textures. I've been happy to, to find in, you know, in recent years, like the last year or so, more often than not now, the Gear and Go developers have gotten the message and generally have the properly compressed textures. And, and that, that has helped a lot. But I'm expecting an influx of new Rift developers into this space that need to learn the lessons again, where you want to be using, on our platform, ASTC, texture compression. Uh, the default, in many cases, is ETC, which doesn't compress quite as well and doesn't have a lot of the flexible options. This is one of the great things about having a fairly constrained platform. If you're an Android developer, in some cases, you would make three different sets of compressed textures. You'd make a PowerVR texture compression, one PVRTC, you'd make uh, ETC, and you'd make ASTC. Uh, for Go and, uh, and Quest, you just make ASTC. You've got a lot of flexibility there. Most people, I say, just pick the 4-bit per pixel one, like ASTC 6x6. It's equivalent to what you're probably used to with DXT or ATC, and it'll wind up looking better. But the better developers now are going through and making custom decisions on a per-texture basis. Like, this low-frequency cloud thing can be 2 bits per pixel. This one uh, shows artifacts. I want it to be perfect. I'll put this up to 8. So you've got a really nice granularity there with the slider. Uh, there are some things that you just can't uh, you just can't make work directly on Quest, like a lot of the quillustrations where they've painted out these beautiful things like Dear Angelica or something that have tens of millions of triangles in some cases. And you just can't render 10 million triangles on Quest. The, the setup unit cannot do that many. You actually can render a few million if you're very careful and you do all the right formats and, and you set everything up cor correctly. But it comes back to it's absolutely possible to capture that look and feel if somebody goes back in and knows they've got a budget and a talented artist says, well, I've got this many triangles as my limit, you can capture basically the same thing. So much of Quill is about doing things very rapidly and fluidly, you know, turning out something in a couple days that is this environment that would have taken far longer to model. But that trade-off, that convenience comes at this trade-off of it is not a very efficient use of polygons. Uh, probably, if we have medium model rendering or something like that, we'll have similar problems there. Now, unfortunately, we still aren't seeing massive wins that we kind of hoped for out of Vulkan as the, the API advancement. Part of that's because uh, the multi-view for OpenGL was a huge win. It took us two and a half years or whatever to get it really rolled through, but that made a big, big difference. It cut in half a lot of the software overhead for drawing the rendering. And while Unity and Unreal have Vulkan uh, backends now that are much more efficient, they wind up coming through to about the efficiency of the multi-view right now. Now, we're expecting soon to have a multi-view Vulkan extension that will bring that back down and hopefully get us to the point where, in theory, you can get about 2x improvement if you don't have much other software overhead versus the, the actual graphics APIs. But it's also taken us a very long time to get the interoperability between, uh, between Vulkan and our compositor backend. So that's, that's in theory working right now, but I don't think we actually have any shipped, uh, shipped applications using it. We had a couple brave developers that were volunteering to build a project with that, which will be uh, an interesting but probably somewhat painful learning experience as we kind of find some more of the dark corners there. One of the things that Quest opens up that we haven't had really the ability to do before is because it has these four cameras on it that are used for the tracking of your head and the controllers, it also means that we can do things like 
pass-through video where we had the pass-through on Gear VR originally, but it was a, it was a small inset window of like a 45-degree uh, horizontal field of view, and it had a lot of latency to it, and it, it just it was not that useful. It took a second and a half to start up, so the idea of having quick access buttons to use it, it wound up not being a particularly useful feature. But on Quest, the cameras are running all the time because they're doing the position tracking. So we can pull out the, uh, the images from that, and we can do it at a fairly low latency uh, rate. And we use this for the Guardian setup when you're kind of initially setting up your play space area and your safe space. Uh, right now, we've got it doing largely a, a traditional pass-through, which can be disorienting because the cameras are not where your eyes are. They're down here. And that means that everything is offset a little bit and feels at the wrong scale. This is something a lot of people figured out in VR that you could use to an artistic advantage. When you change the, uh, the inner pupillary distance of the cameras, you change the perceived scale of the world. And it's the whole like Alice growing or shrinking effect when you can make things feel like this is a tiny little model versus something enormous. And this winds up hurting even in some of the, uh, like the very high-end professional 180 vi video that's shot with like these big red cameras. They literally can't get them close enough together to have the proper IPD. So a lot of people have commented that it looks like they're tiny people. You know, everybody is, uh, is much smaller than they should be because they were kind of taken from a, a wider view. But we have a lot of technology work going on for ways that we can possibly make this more comfortable, where it's understanding the world more than just passing it through. And there's a couple different technology paths that we're looking at, uh, some of which we're, we're prototyping on more, you know, more powerful headsets, but they rely on either finding features and getting depth from that, or looking at the video streams, kind of like the asynchronous space warp does, and taking motion vectors between them. And this is all bleeding edge right now and not guaranteed to be shipping, but that's something that may wind up improving the pass-through experience there quite a bit. Uh, we have a, a, another internal research project to try and do pass-through. What would be the best pass-through we could do if that was a primary goal, where it's clearly a secondary goal on Quest, where they are there for the position tracking and for the controller tracking, that we can use them for other things is sort of a, uh, a side benefit. Although there is one aspect to that that I'm happy that I stood firm on at the beginning, where the initial thought was for maximum robustness in tracking and for maximum tracking of your controllers, you really would want all four of them pointing out at uh, kind of pointing away from each other because you can catch more of the wall over there. There's a lot of the robustness that we get with Quest compared to something like a Solo or some of the mixed reality headsets with two cameras is that you can point at a blank wall and Quest will still work well because it's got other things pointing you know, up and down in other directions. It's a trade-off, it costs more, and there's more complexity for doing, uh, doing the extra cameras. But the, uh, the thing that I pushed for was making sure that at least two of the cameras covered in stereo the field of view that you can actually see. They're much wider angle than the 90 to 100 degree field of view that, that you get in VR, but if we at least overlap them on that, then we've got this ability to do some of these depth estimations. And the other thing that we are working on internally is like native hand tracking, completely separate from the controllers. Right now, it's, you know, it's really slow. It takes a lot of computing power, but it's at least theoretically possible that we can make this work. It's unlikely to be a shipping feature on Quest, but we can use this hardware platform to start researching some of these things that future systems will have kind of the, the power and ability to do real time. So one of the other, of course, real benefits of hand tracking is the idea that you can use them in this emotive social way, that talking with your hands in, uh, in meetings and social gatherings is one of the, the things that makes it so much more interesting than a kind of static fixed avatar. And things like Spaces and a lot of the, the third-party applications have been working on this for a long time now, uh, all the ways that given that 6-6 uh, positioning that you can do really great things. And I, I had the argument with some of those people internally where uh, many of them did have the, the view that it's just not worth even trying this on a 3.3 system like Gear VR or Go. And I think some of them have come around a little bit and that venues and rooms are, uh, are proving valuable for many people. But uh, the 6.6 definitely lets you go, you know, go the extra mile there. Now, with social obviously being a big focus, I, realistically, 
we've got the, the issues of concurrency and friend graph density and all of these things, but Facebook is all about connecting the world. That's the mission there. So it does mean I'm a little bit out of step sometimes as the champion of the power of isolation, where I really do think that one of the, the superpowers of VR is the ability to isolate you often from your environment. That I used to talk about it, how you're respecting your media when you are just in the VR space watching, you know, watching the screen and there's nothing else distracting you. Or I say it's like headphones for your eyes, where if you're in a big, messy, open office situation, being annoyed by everybody, if you could put on a headset and be in a productive work environment that's peaceful around you, that there's real value there. And it turns out there's real value for that for training situations, where I you know there are it is an issue getting people to pay attention a lot of times to things like safety briefings. And while people have immediately jumped to the clockwork orange vision of the, the peeled open eyelids of, you know, you are forced to watch this, uh, there are real legitimate values in putting somebody in an environment where they only have one thing that they can choose to concentrate on. And I do think that's going to be very important for education eventually. You know, we're not... Uh, you know, we are not making any great strides uh, pushing forward with education, but I think clearly that's going to be one of the really important things uh, that VR winds up making a difference on. I, I was in a, uh, the last time I was out here for that offsite uh, I, that I mentioned at the beginning, when I was flying back, uh, I was in the, hotel, in the airport waiting lounge, lots of people making lots of noise, I was annoyed, I put on my go, and I was in my Netflix room and I watched a show, and, and it was great. That is exactly what VR was supposed to be for. Now, of course, if you do that today in reality, you're sort of making a spectacle out of yourself. And, uh, and it was true that on the airplane, I had brought it out again, and the person across the aisle said, what does it look like in there? And I wound up by uh, showing Henry and some 180 VR basketball footage, and they wound up going to Amazon on the airplane Wi-Fi and ordering a go, like right there, which is pretty magical when you think about it. We really are living in the future that we can do this. So, uh, but still, we have marching orders that social is one of the most important things that, uh, that we need to be working on. We need to be combating the isolation of VR. And we have a few of these wonderful asymmetric games, like Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes and Covert. Uh, that is a lot of fun to be able to play with one person looking at a cell phone, directing you, telling you to, to do something. But these are very specific niche games, and most of the content library uh, you know, doesn't have anything like that. But the VR mirroring, the new stuff, the casting to the phones and eventually to the screens, is going to be a, a wonderful, wonderful thing for that. Uh, it makes it so much more fun to have somebody using VR, even if you're just looking over their virtual shoulder through the, through the casting onto the screen. So I, I'm really excited about that. Uh, one of the interesting things that when we were discussing uh, mirroring and some of the other things at one point, Narav had suggested that, you know, LCD screens for low-end cell phones are really dirt cheap. We could kind of put an LCD screen on the front of a headset, and, you know, it's like it would hurt Go's thermal dissipation, and it's not, uh, there would be challenges with that, but it's not a completely insane idea that you could have a VR headset that just is literally, you could maybe tap, turn it on or off to show what's there, show googly eyes or something or some animation if you don't want the actual content shown. But the idea of trying to actively combat as a high order, uh, you know, as one of your real goals, saying we want to make this less isolating, we want to bring more people into it. So there may be something you know, along those lines where the hardware actually starts changing. Another thing, I, we have been big on isolation. We've done a couple experiments where cutting things away so that I could see keyboards for desktop development, and then some people cutting everything away so that you can see all the way out to the side so you can have VR down and be kind of side-eye having a conversation with a worker, a coworker next to you. So there may be other, uh, other parts of the VR immersion space that are still valuable for different reasons. Uh, I did not get something I talked about last year a lot was this social substrate of that VR shell was originally designed so that any shell application you're doing would be uh, immediately social, naively, without having to do anything. A lot of that work was ongoing sort of into venues. Venues wound up being a fork of shell. Hopefully at some point we're able to merge them back together again, but development uh, necessities and team dynamics wound up with that happening. But right now we are heavily focused on co-watching in TV. 
which is the first case of this is inside shell, it's the shell application, and we're getting our act together with how do you nicely invite friends and avatars in and watch the same thing directly. And what I hope comes out of this, I mean, realistically, you know, we can look at the numbers, this many people are gonna use TV, we're, we are gonna do a bunch of promotional stuff around it, but the overlap between people, it's not gonna be huge numbers of people that are simultaneously watching this. But if we can find the kernel of a behavior, a new behavior that people didn't have before, I think that like Go at 199 is cheap enough that I think we will find people that go out and buy a pair of Go's, not because they care about VR at all, but because they want to be able to do something with a loved one that's across the country. And this won't necessarily be a groundswell of people, but if this is an activity that you do for this reason, not because it's VR, not because you're into VR or a technology enthusiast, but because you do want to connect with someone else, someone that you care about, that you are physically separate from, that we can take this, this mantra of defy distance and give you that sense of social presence next to someone else and have an experience, a mundane, simple, watching television together experience, but with some feeling that you look over and they're actually there. Uh, this will, TV will be coming over to Quest as well, so you'll have the, the two hands for the, the better uh, emotive gestures and all the different presence there, the better head movement and positioning, but it should also work out quite well on Go. Uh, that sense of being able to have the nicely spatialized audio, that sense that you are kind of right next to someone if everything is set up right. Now, that is another thing that technically that I think we can make some good progress on, and that's the, the voice latency across, uh, across the, the social systems, where it's funny now that so many people are so young that they don't remember original local analog line phone calls where things were immediate and instantaneous and how jarring it really was as people adapted to the latency in normal cell phone conversations. And we are, we're in a position where we can probably make most VoIP conversations in VR across the internet I, much better latency than typical cell phone conversations to give you a little bit more of that sense of immediacy and that that you're actually there next to someone. Um, one of the other big topics that I had last year was about all the different video work, and this is one that I'm honestly pretty disappointed that we weren't able to make more progress on really nailing and moving forward with immersive video. And a lot of it is because our relatively small internal media team, they just got pulled from project to project where you can't work on Oculus Video anymore, you have to work on Oculus Gallery because we have no other way to see uh, a lot of this media on Go. Now you can't work on Gallery anymore, you have to go work on TV because co-watching is our, you know, our current strategy for pushing forward the social stuff. Um, so for whatever reasons, you know, we wound up not getting a lot of the things that I was excited about, like getting perfect frame releases, improving the quality and the bit rates and projections of, uh, of all these different things. And there's an interesting new wrinkle with this, where with Go being able to run at 72 frames per second, my initial thought was that we should switch to 60 frames per second when you are uh, watching something that is either 60 or 30 frames per second, and then stay at 72 frames per second if you're at a 24 frames per second. So it's this exact either one, two, or three uh, vertical retraces between the, the video. But by a quirk of what we have, the way things are implemented right now, if you have an MP4 file that only has, I think, four or less channels of audio, uh, it will play through uh, the video direct code, the, the, the kind of specialized standalone code that I wrote, and it funnels everything through that. And that does do the switching down to 60. But if it's in another format, like an MKV, then it winds up playing through the standard uh, video pr processing path, which does not switch down. So I had somebody contact me and say, hey, this same video, I play this one and it's flickering. And it took me a little while. I first thought he meant something really gratuitous like black frames coming in on alternate frames or something. But it turned out that he really meant just that one of them was playing at 60 frames per second. That was a worst case video with lots of white all in the corners. But it was, it was one of the people that was fairly struck by that. So that was an interesting thought. And now I am, I'm uncertain about what the right thing to do there is, which means we'll probably wind up making it a setting where if you've got a 60 frames per second video, you absolutely want to be at 60 frames per second. You want it to be perfectly smooth because every little drop destroys uh, that sense of immersion. Like I look at this all the time. Yesterday at the main keynote, our million dollar production for all of this, they're showing the thousands of apps that are going by smoothly panning, glitch, 
smooth glitch. And this, you know, this happens across the highest level of professional video, but uh, it matters much more in VR. I mean, yes, if it's just on the screen that you're looking at, people kind of with the latency on voice, people just kind of say, well, video's like that nowadays. But it doesn't have to be. You know, we should be striving to be better. And 60 frames per second locked VR video is one of those magical things. It still has all the limits of don't turn your head like this, but uh, when it's all done right, it is one of the very best things that, you know, that we can do. And that's one of the, the wins from this year was the 5K video streaming stuff, the view-dependent video streaming that I did for the Henry release. And my main goal on that was I'm always talking about it doesn't have to be like this or it should be better. Uh, so much of my my duties are to provide these lighthouse experiences, to show people VR Shell shows you text doesn't have to be unreadable. It doesn't have to be flickering, shimmering, and hard to read. You can do all of these things right, and it can look good. We don't need bigger displays or changes in GPUs or something. You just need to do it right. And this was the same thing on video, where videos do not have to be this kind of blurry mess that stutters and, uh, and just looks terrible you can have something that looks really, really good. And so Henry was basically doing everything right with this, 5K by 5K video, stereo, 60 frames per second, only possible with this, uh, this extra bit of technology. And I was very happy that I was allowed to release this open source. Uh, this is something that I'm still grappling with a little bit, trying to make changes at Facebook, where Facebook is very serious about the responsibility of open source. They have huge, hugely important projects like React that, uh, that tons and tons of people rely on. So the process, there is a many-page document about how to do open source at Facebook, which is, involves like who's signing up for maintaining this over all of this period of time, and uh, who's going to be reviewing all of these different things. And I'm used to just saying, here's some source code. I hope it's useful for somebody. Um, and it looks like the, the magic words for doing that is, you know, it's not an open source project. These, this is example code uh, that we can bundle with other things. So I think I'm working out the path to be able to do more of that, hopefully, in the future. Because what I want to do is get this, essentially, on GitHub, uh, where we can we can see updates. Because even since the Henry release there, I, I I made some additional updates for the Jurassic World uh, Blue release. They do, Felix and Paul do some interesting technical things with that where it's not just an equirect. If you notice in most 3D videos, including Henry, you look down and if you've got proper depth perception, it looks kind of like you're sitting in a giant bowl that it goes off to infinity. Usually less of a problem for the skies, but you have to get rid of the depth uh, below you just because otherwise your eyes try to cross and go backwards when it sees past the pole. So Felix and Paul did something uh, interesting in their presentation to avoid that because you can look down at the ground on blue and it looks like it's at you know, the right depth. So there were some changes along the way for there, like Henry had everything fixed in this band in the middle while we moved it down for Jurassic Park because more of the stuff is kind of below horizon level and the ground looks good. I know what I need to do eventually is write a real GUI tool that lets us adjust all of this dynamically because I'm... Uh, I have Dear Angelica encoded on this, but we're still, uh, we're not quite through the release process on this. And I learned even more with that, with all of the hard brush strokes that really showed out the, the transitions between the high detail and low detail. So I added some blending and blending in of the things so they don't pop in. Uh, and a bunch of these new lessons that I, that I want to get out to everybody. But what I really want to do is have this so that you could, a producer can go ahead and lay out the 360, and then lay out a timeline of the entire video. It's split into 10 slices. You should be able to kind of push those up or down to cover exactly the detail you want for everything. Now, that's not something everybody's going to want to do, but I hope that every Felix and Paul video gets remastered like this. And for you know, the amount of money that goes into those productions, spending a day uh, kind of plus minusing through all, getting the details in the right places is absolutely worthwhile. One of the other big wins on the video side uh, you know, post, uh, for the post-Go launch was getting 5K video support uh, on the Go, where for a long time now, we've had really since the, um, is it since S6 or certainly since S7 for everything, we've been able to decode 4K 60 video, where you can do 4K by 2K 60 frames per second. Now, if you divide that out, uh, it would seem that, well, that should also allow us to do um, 
uh, you know, 5760 by 2880 at 30 frames per second. It's the same number of pixels. Most things are kind of flexible like that. And in fact, the Exynos chipsets could do that, but the Qualcomm chipsets stopped at 4K maximum uh, dimensions. So I had been kind of uh, prodding the Qualcomm engineers about, can we do anything about this? It would really help some people doing professional video work. Uh, some of the workflows from the cameras, uh, we'd like, this is optimal for our screen resolution. We didn't need to go all the way up, where the screen resolution optimal is only 5120 by 2560. Uh, 5760 is more than you need and can even be a net negative, even if you're throwing all the bandwidth at it. And eventually, they, they came around and it was kind of funny. I was throwing some quotes at them from people. I didn't realize there was this uh, community where there are fanboy uh, wars between chipsets on mobile phones, and I didn't realize that was a thing, but I would find Exynos people ragging on the Qualcomm chipsets about they can't even play these videos that I've been able to play for a while. Uh, you know, and I brought all of those to Qualcomm's attention, and eventually they did... I, and it turned out to be more work than I thought. I, I had mistakenly thought that, don't you just have to change a, a constant there that I thought they were just saying, well, the spec only goes up to here. This is all we're going to do, kind of a conservative viewpoint. But they did actually have to re-architect some non-trivial things to, to make it work. But it does work, and it's out there right now. So I, you, can, I, you can play these. We have a quirky set of restrictions for the way this works right now. This new technology, this new uh, limit was only unlocked for H.264. So if you want to play a 5K video, it means you want to be an H.264. H.265 can't play wider than 5K, but it can play taller than 5K. So you get into the point, well, if you've got a, you know, a two to one aspect ratio, you can translate it uh, or you can transpose it vertically and then play it like that, but then you need to make sure that the player has a little something different there. Uh, somewhat related to that, something that I discovered this year was that I've, it's possible to interleave frames on stereo instead of doing top, bottom, or left, right. If you do interleaved frames, H.265 especially, when you've got the very slow preset and it's looking across lots of frames for motion vectors, that gave a startlingly high compression ratio, like over 30% better, which is probably all you ever would have gotten with the old multi-view coding that was made for 3D TVs, which is not supported on the current chipsets. Uh, but no video player right now plays interleaved. You have to do some extra buffering and work through that, but that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh, and one cool thing that was great for Henry and some of these other 5K high quality things, we had an internal research prototype that was a Gear VR headset, but with some research lenses that gave it like 120, they were huge lenses, like 120 degree field of view uh, that used, you could put in one of the larger Samsung phones that had the wider aspect ratio and it would use all of the extra pixels there. And at first, when I heard about that, I thought that it would be bad because I thought, I know stretching the same number of pixels across the wider field of view uh, really kills things in the middle and is bad for it. But the way the optics worked on this, the middle stayed about the same resolution. It just went all the way out to the edges and scrunched those pixels a little bit. And looking at these 5K videos inside that was pretty damn impressive. We showed that to Samsung as like, here's something that maybe we could consider this for, for a future device, but it would have more manufacturing challenges and so on. But, uh, but it was great to see the high-end VR videos there. Um, I am running out of time, so let me skip down to some other stuff. I, the, I, one of the other major projects that I did this last year was doing some work on remote desktop work, where everybody's seen the let's just project your PC screen into VR. You can do it directly with Dash. Uh, you can do it to mobile with a number of different apps that have, have taken a stab at this. But I, it's really at least for productivity stuff. Every programmer say, I can't wait till I can program in VR. It's really kind of a, a gimmick thing the way it's generally been seen. And the way I presented it internally is that uh, our current resolution in our systems, we in VR Shell, we recommend 13 pixels per degree for display. You can actually go a little bit higher than that, but we use that so that as you're going vertically where it's not curved, it doesn't fall off an alias so soon. And if you run those numbers out, even a 1280 by 720 monitor is, is enormous. It's an IMAX screen, and you're spending all of your time looking side to side. 
but I had been saying internally, one of my pitches was, we have a high-end research going on about using the cameras to be able to look at your keyboard, to be able to kind of see that, track other objects, track your keyboard and mouse through the VR display. But I had been saying for a long time, just let's cut out the bottom of it so you can look under, like I'm looking under my glasses right now. It's like, yes, sometimes you wish that you could look down straight through it, but you can get a lot done like that. And we had been talking about the future of work and the pitches that we should be doing as this strategic direction in the future. But eventually I said, well, I'm just going to go do this right now. We had somebody, uh, some of our hardware people chop up a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of goes. We tried a number of different things ranging from a small cut just for the keyboard to cutting away most of the bottom. And since then, we've had people cut away everything so you could have the kind of coworker vision. And then I started working on writing a custom application to do the remote desktop work. Oh, before that, one of the things that I did try that I'd been meaning to for a while was seeing what we could get in terms of super resolution. Uh, because the idea that the way desktop monitors work, LCDs, is you have red, green, blue pixels and high quality text rendering, like clear type and, uh, and other technologies like that, they wind up rasterizing things at this sub-pixel level. So even if you say, you've got a 2560 resolution monitor, it's really three times that in the horizontal direction. And that does help pretty significantly with text rendering. So for a long time, I had been considering trying to do that on, uh, on Gear VR initially and then go. It's like, is there a 3x factor of resolution that we can unlock somehow? And it turned out I, it can't really be done like that for something that wasn't immediately obvious where for it to work out, you would have to have your chromatic aberration correction accurate to a third of a pixel, or at least less than a pixel for it to be valuable. Because if the pixels, the colors, have spread out further over there, and you're saying, I'm expecting it to be here, but it winds up here, it's not really extra resolution. And while it's plausible that we could, uh, we could generate a correction curve that has that level of accuracy, the reality is that people never put the headset on in exactly the same position. And while our, our chromatic aberration correction looks really good, it's a great improvement right now, it is not one-third of a pixel accurate. And you can see, if you just move the headset around, tilt it around a little bit, things are moving around a little bit, you'll see a hint of a fringe coming on one edge, then the other. So that was not a key to new resolution, but something I, I learned that was completely new that I had never suspected was I had... For my test for this, I had a resolution chart, just things with expanding bands and, uh, you know, and horizontal and vertical lines. And I chose it so it was high enough resolution that it was aliasing pretty badly. So it had all the fizzly edges that I hate on things. And I noticed by accident that if I tilted my head, somehow it seemed to get very crisp and it lost the aliasing edges and it looked really good. I'm like, this is interesting. This is a novel effect. And I did some experimenting with it and it does turn out that in many scenes that have like horizontal and vertical lines that are lining up with the display pixels, a lot of times the aliasing comes in from rasterizing to that and then distorting it and then showing it at the screens. So in some cases, there is a, uh, there is a win to be had by rotating your eye buffers. And I considered maybe making this a default option. I am... But for every rotation, there's going to be something in the world that lines up with that and then uh, shows what the current horizontal and vertical ones do. But there may be cases where this is an interesting technology that can actually have some value. But So I wound up not getting any, any spectacular wins for the, the resolution there. But I started off with a basic uh, virtual desktop, kind of a, a VNC RDP protocol. I uh, took my desktop machines, put it up in there, got the mouse cursor working, which was kind of interesting where when I first, you can plug in a lot of, uh, you can get some, some Bluetooth mouse and keyboards to work. You can actually pair some of them through Twilight. Uh, it's hit or miss. We don't, we don't exactly have a list of supported devices. You can also take the little USB RF dongles and just kind of plug that into the micro USB and then use uh, their keyboard and mouse. So there's a number of ways to get keyboard and mouse working. And with the cutout there, you can see it reasonably well. So I took uh, the remote desktop and I did my normal kind of VR shell route of I put it on a nice cylindrical layer I am at the recommended resolutions. And it's enormous and I do some work going on. One of the first things I noticed was that I am, while the cylindrical curve works great for that axis, 
Vertically, it's still just a flat projection, and eventually you run out of resolution, but you also then start running into our limited distortion mesh, where you start seeing things get a little bit wiggly down at the bottom. And if you look really carefully, you can see this even in some conventional apps. Like, I've spent so much time in the Netflix scene that I noticed that the table in front of you with the magazines there that's down near the, the bottom of my vision, as I you know, move around a little bit, I can see the distortion kind of wiggling those pixels, but very few people will be able to notice something like that. Uh, it does show up also in Equirect presentations where some of that, at a certain point, there's an area where you see those getting a little bit wiggly. So one of the things I had to do quality-wise to make the desktop work better was to make, I uh, was to increase the density of the distortion mesh, and that cleaned up the wiggles on there, and we'll probably make that some kind of a performance option, probably a flag on layers at some point for people to use. I, uh, but the thing that was really important was giving up on this 13 or 14 pixels per degree and say, well, we've got, in my case, I was streaming like a 5K pair of desktop monitors. Uh, let's go ahead and take all of that and let me shrink it down and, and spread it out and use some pre-filtering technology to say, we know what resolution it's going to be. We've got the high res. Let's filter it down, not just with a MIP map where you're just factors of two and you're either too aliased or too blurry or blended between them, but to actually filter it correctly for the resolution that it was going to be. And then the key was having a really fast, uh, expressive way of panning around this desktop. So I made it so that touch shift on the keyboard and I could move the mouse around, and it could pan the whole desktop around, and mouse wheel would zoom it in and out. So at that point, I could actually get some real work done. Uh, I would start the, start the day, put on my Go, I uh, bring up Visual Studio and Eudora, and I uh, start working on Outlook and start working on things. I am, um, and it was the first day I'm working on this, and one hour later, my eyes are just hurting. Uh, it's the strain of kind of looking at things at this distance. I am, um, you know, and it, it was bothersome. I found that if I pushed everything out to uh, to like 32 meters in the great distance, that worked a lot better, and I was comfortable for another hour. Uh, I got all of the the desktop stuff so I could really do my work well. I was thinking some things, oh, they're saying we're done right now. <laughs> okay, well, we can continue out in the hall, anybody that wants. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. All right.